Inventors bring the future closer to us. The right invention in the right place at the right time can change the world. But some inventions are further ahead of their time than others. In some cases, the great inventors of the past had ideas that didn't become commonplace until hundreds of years later. You'll see some of the brightest and best of them in this video. The Greek scientist, inventor, and mathematician Archimedes was once quoted as saying, Give me a place to stand, and I'll move the world. We can't even imagine what he would have been capable of if he'd had access to modern technology. But we do know that he achieved more with ropes and pulleys than anybody else who ever lived. Among the many things he achieved with the pulley was the Archimedes screw, which provided a reliable means of irrigating land for farming. There's some conjecture about whether Archimedes truly developed the screw-type pump or whether he merely improved on a design he'd seen in Egypt. But either way, it was a great leap forward. Archimedes defined a pulley as any wheel supporting any rope or cable and demonstrated that such a system could be used to transfer motion and energy just as efficiently as any lever. One story says he loaded heavy cargo onto a ship single-handedly using a system of compound pulleys and cranes that he'd devised. Compound pulley systems are the basic idea behind the elevators and escalators we use today. So every time you catch the elevator, rather than walking up a long staircase, remember to thank Archimedes. The Swiss Army Knife is every adventurer's friend. If you're heading out into the great outdoors for a little wild camping, you'd be foolish not to take one with you. Should we really credit the Swiss for the invention of the ubiquitous multi-tool, though? Possibly not. This Roman answer to the Swiss Army knife was found during archaeological excavations on the Mediterranean coast in 2019. It was made during the 3rd century and came complete with a toothpick, a spatula, a fork, a spoon, and a knife. Based on that, it was probably used to prepare and then eat meals. The knife is silver, which suggests that the tool belonged to someone important. In fact, given that we've only ever found one such device, the person who owned it might have also been the person who invented it. We'll never know whether that was the case, but what we do know is that the Swiss Army knife wasn't invented until 1,500 years after this anonymous Roman inventor made their pocket meal kit. Why didn't the idea catch on at the time? We wish we knew. You'd have thought that the invention of the parachute came after the invention of the airplane, but that isn't the case. The earliest known design for a parachute can be seen in an Italian manuscript that was published during the 1470s. Sadly, the author of that manuscript chose to remain anonymous. Leonardo da Vinci then sketched a plausible design for a parachute with a canopy held open by a square wooden frame in Codex Atlanticus in 1485. However, historians don't think that the polymath ever built or tested such a device. Instead, the invention of the parachute is credited to the Venetian inventor Fausto Veranzio, who came up with the parachute design called the Flying Man in 1595. Veranzio's design was based on da Vinci's sketches from a century earlier, but he replaced da Vinci's canopy with a piece of cloth that acted as a sail. Records from the time indicate that Veranzio successfully demonstrated the Flying Man in front of hundreds of eyewitnesses by jumping off a tower in Venice in 1617. Again, we're not sure why more parachutes didn't appear after that. Perhaps nobody could think of a practical application for them. Legend has it that the Egyptian pharaoh Ptolemy IV Philopater of Egypt built an enormous catamaran galley almost 2,200 years ago. The vessel was called Tessera Contaris and had space enough inside for 4,000 people. How much is true and how much is myth is difficult to say, but there are several ancient scribes including Plutarch, Athenius, and Calexinus of Rhodes who claim to have seen it with their own eyes. If it existed and it was as big as it's supposed to be, it would have been too large to be of any use as a warship, so instead was probably a prestige vessel. It was also probably the biggest human-powered ship ever built. 
Collectionist of Rhodes claims that Tessera Conteris was 420 feet long, 80 feet tall, and 57 feet wide. It's thought that the world's first ever dry dock had to be built purely to house, then launch the colossal ship. Modern day researchers think that the size of the vessel has been exaggerated by historical sources. They point out that if it was double proud in the way it's said to have been, the sheer force of water pressure would tear the prows apart. We'll probably never know how true the old legends are. Speaking of the ancient Egyptians, how did they achieve such wonderful architectural and technical things? How did they build the pyramids and their other incredible monuments? The answer might be that they had tools that we tend not to assume they had. Examples would include copper stabbing saws and copper coring drills. Look at ancient Egyptian art, and you'll see repeated images of Egyptians using copper saw blades, including some of the art that's now on display in the Petrie Museum. You can even see evidence of saws being used as a means of cutting rock on ancient Egyptian stonework, like Sekhemkit's alabaster sarcophagus and on the lid of the granite sarcophagus of Marisank. As for the coring drills, some of them have already been found. They're just misunderstood by historians. A typical Egyptian coring drill is made of wood, with a discharge head to eject the drill bit. They came with capstone bearings made of hard stone with another hole in the end for the insertion of the drill stop. Again, you can see images of ancient Egyptians using bow drills in artwork, such as the illustrations inside the 5th dynasty tomb of Tai in Saqqara. Why so many historians and scientists choose to ignore this evidence is a mystery to us. Thanks to the events of 2020, we all had to get comfortable with the concept of the video call, whether we wanted to or not. What many of the people doing so for the first time wouldn't have known is that video phones have been around since 1964. Back then, the equivalent of Zoom was a device called the AT&T Bell Labs Picture Phone. Even then, the idea wasn't new. A similar concept had been patented in Germany in 1932. Bell Labs demonstrated the picture phone at the 1964 World's Fair in New York, allowing visitors to make video calls to guests in Disneyland in California. The picture quality was awful, but people were impressed by the technology. The engineers behind the idea hoped it would raise both interest levels and funds in the idea of a broadband phone network connected through Ethernet cables that could handle more data than traditional twisted pair copper wires. In other words, the engineers had visualized the internet and wanted funding to bring the idea to life. Sadly, the picture phone was too expensive for home use and too niche for businesses who could afford it. At $20 a minute, which works out to $120 per minute in 2022 dollars, it was poor value for money. The idea was eventually abandoned and the picture phone was considered a failure. How times change. The ancient Romans were big fans of orgies, but weren't quite so keen on the consequences of these orgies. That's why they believed in practicing birth control. Ancient Roman birth control looked nothing like the kind of birth control that most of the civilized world is able to call upon today, though. Instead, they ate a plant called silphium, which was said to be capable of preventing pregnancy and also destroying one that already existed. The issue was that they ate so much of it that the plant is now extinct, so it's hard to verify the claims. Historical records indicate that silphium was once a common plant in the Greek city of Cyrene, which is now part of Libya, but it also grew elsewhere on the north coast of Africa. It seems to have been a miracle plant, as resin made from its stalk was also used to treat fever, nausea, and other ailments. Some texts even say that a single chickpea-sized dose of resin would induce menstruation in women almost immediately, thus rendering them temporarily infertile. The plant was harvested to extinction in the first century and has no known related species still living today. During the peak years of the Roman Empire, the Romans mastered the art of making glass and concrete. In fact, the concrete they made is vastly superior to the concrete we use today. Portland cement, which is about the industry standard today, would only last for about a century in a marine environment, even if it were to be reinforced with rebar. 
Compare that to the ancient Roman arches, breakwaters, aqueducts, and other buildings which have remained standing for 2,000 years. Even in highly corrosive salt water, Roman concrete remains intact. That's all due to the way they made it. The Romans combined volcanic ash and lime to create mortar, then mixed it with volcanic rock as aggregate. You can find evidence of this construction in the Parthenon and also Trajan's markets in Rome. Using this mixture means that the Roman concrete that still exists today is full of tobermorite, zeolite, and philipsite. These minerals got there as seawater found its way into the concrete and reacted with the lime and volcanic ash, creating the interlocking minerals and filling void spaces. Exposure to seawater made the concrete stronger, not weaker. As for the reason we don't use it today, nobody's ever been able to get the mixture quite right since the fall of the Roman Empire. You'll find our next machine in almost every office space in the world. No, we're not talking about the computer, we're talking about the vending machine. Incredibly, the vending machine has been around since the time of Christ. The first vending machines didn't sell snacks and soda though, they sold holy water. The world's first ever vending machine was designed by Heron of Alexandria as a solution to a problem that had developed at his local temple. Priests had begun to complain that parishioners were taking more than their fair share of holy water and not paying the required temple tax to cover the cost of it. Heron's mechanical solution involved placing the water inside a cylindrical, coin-operated device. Inserting a coin in the appropriate place put pressure on a crank inside the machine the crank opened a valve and the water was released. When the coin slid away from its position, the pressure on the crank would ease and the valve would snap shut. Through this method, every worshiper got precisely the amount of holy water they paid for, and nobody was able to cheat the system. The vending machines of today are a little more secure and advanced, but they work on the same principle. The steam train was invented in the United Kingdom and trains are still a vital transport link within the country today, but these days they're almost all powered by electricity. The evolution of trains didn't go directly from steam to electricity, though. There were a few experimental train types trialed between the two eras, including the Crystal Palace Pneumatic Railway. This was an atmospheric railway, one that made use of air pressure differentials to prepare railway carriages down the track, and it was designed by Thomas Webster Rammel. The design bore some similarities to the proposed hyperloop systems of today. Train capsules would be sucked down airtight tunnels at high speeds, encountering limited friction along the way. He successfully operated the line for a little over two months and almost saw his idea enter mass production with a second line planned between London's Waterloo and Whitehall. But the project was called off before it could be finished. Nobody seems to know why the idea wasn't taken any further, but if the Hyperloop is ever a success, part of the credit should be given to Rammel. The Saqqara bird really shouldn't be such a big mystery. After all, it's just a tiny ancient Egyptian hand carving. What could be so mysterious about that? The answer is that its proportions are perfectly engineered to be capable of flight. If you threw this 2,200-year-old artifact off the top of a mountain, it would glide perfectly, with just the same aerodynamic efficiency as any glider we'd be capable of making today. Although the artifact has a bird's head, the rest of it looks more like a plane than anything avian. The wings are featherless, flat, thin, and tapered. The tail is square. During the 1970s, a curious group of students scaled up the Saqqara bird to make a plane-sized replica and demonstrated that it could both fly and glide without any tailoring required. If this had been made in the past decade, we wouldn't hesitate to call it a model aircraft. But the ancient Egyptians had no aircraft to use as reference guides when making models. Might this have been a flying child's toy of some kind? Or did the person who made this understand the basic principles of flight, even if they couldn't make a powered flying machine? Here's a fact that's almost impossible to comprehend. 1,200 years ago, the Chimu civilization of Peru invented a basic form of the telephone. It's not exactly a smartphone, but it's capable of enabling spoken communication across short distances. 
The Chimu telephone was found in the ruins of Chan Chan in late 2020, and it's the only artifact of its kind ever to be found in the country. You might have made something similar to it when you were a child. The telephone is made of a pair of cups connected by a 70-foot-long cotton twine string. We think the cord may have run between two neighboring houses, or perhaps from one end of a large communal building to the other. Archaeologists can't decide whether it was thought of as a sophisticated device for the use of the elite or whether it was a simple child's toy. We might never find that out because the Chimu had no written language, so they didn't leave behind any records for us to consult. It's not the most high-tech phone you'll ever see, but it would have worked perfectly well. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.